welcome everyone to our panel discussion today, A Recruiter's Guide to Getting Hired, which is part of our ongoing Grad Talk series. Today, we're going to hear from graduates who are working in the area of recruitment who will share their insights into the hiring process and how to best approach your job search. It's my pleasure to introduce the panelists we have on board for today's discussion. A warm welcome to David Mendoza. David is CEO of Orbit5, a company that provides resources and support for international students and graduates, newcomers and entrepreneurs who are navigating their career pathway. David and his colleagues train job seekers on how to land ideal jobs in less than 15 weeks. David also provides language, coaching, e-learning and educational tourism to those searching for something to en enhance their life experiences. David is also a part-time faculty member at George Brown College, where he teaches digital skills for life and work, as well as career and life transitions. He's also, also multilingual and a proud graduate of the GBC Career and Work Counselor Program. Aishwara, nice. yeah, welcome, David. <laughs> Aishwara Kumar is a talent acquisition professional with over eight years of experience. She is a GBC alumni who graduated from the Human Resource Management Postgrad Certificate Program. Aishwara started her career in India working for an executive search firm managing international clients across various industries. Subsequently, as an immigrant to Canada, GBC played a crucial role in shaping her career and helped with the transition to the Canadian work environment. She has gained valuable HR experience and exposure working for healthcare and global cons consumer goods companies. She's currently working for Kenview, previously known as Johnson & Johnson, consumer health company as a senior talent acquisition specialist. Aisha is a diversity and inclusion advocate and is passionate about being an employee branding ambassador for her company. Welcome, Aish. Thank you. Thanks, Trisha. Matthew Braddock is a graduate of 2021 from our Human Resource Management Program. His very first opportunity was an internship with the Hospital for Sick Children, from which he was hired full time. And this set him on a pathway of success that has taken him to his current role at Canadian Blood Services as Talent Acquisition Coordinator where he's involved in the candidate selection process and loves the opportunity to bring on top-notch talent to the organizational team. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Trisha. So glad you could all join us today. So let's get going. And, you know, grads are always really curious about how other graduates got on their career path. So I think we're going to start there. Can you share with us what pivotal things happened to you that shaped your career choices and how you ended up in the work you do? And if George Brown College contributed to your career success, we'd love to hear about that too. Who would like to start us off? Um, I can start if you want. Fantastic, uh, David. George Brown definitely uh, played a huge role in my career success and the choices that I made. When I arrived in Canada 17 years ago, a year after I did a marketing program, and then I went to the Career Center to get guidance on my resume and how to find a job. And when I left the office from the career advisor, I thought, oh my God, I really like that job that this guy did. I wonder what he did to get that role. Coincidentally, I got a job at a private college doing international student recruitment. And then I started doing some basic counseling there. And then I found a career counselor program at George Brown. I took it in 2010. And I was very clear that I wanted to get into education full on. I'm more into the career coaching path. And that's how it started. So that's how... I shaped my career in education with students in post-secondary and definitely George Brown paved the path for that because of the connections that I made, the mentors that I got, including you, Tricia, back in the day in 2010 when I started my internship mm -hmm. at the Career Center. Uh, so definitely it gave, helped me gain a lot of clarity in what I wanted to do and explore other options to start my own business as well. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the business. Yes. So my business, we train international students and newcomers to land jobs in less than 15 weeks. So I was working at the Career Center at the time. This was back in 2015. I was part time working there. And I had started doing my, my part time faculty role at the college. And I just wanted to do something else with my skill that, that kind of like limited me less so that I wanted to explore more options. And I decided to start Orbit 5 with someone. We parted ways a year after, but recently, a couple of years ago, I partnered up with someone else. So we are transforming this career coaching initiative now into more of an IT educational solution to support colleges, students, and employers at the same time. 
and mm -hmm. technology and artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning. So, but it started like that, like an idea. Um, mm -hmm. How can I do a workshop with these people or how can I do a one on one with one client and get some testimonials and start there. But it started with an idea that I got through all the work that I did with the students at George Brown and all the mentors mm -hmm. that I got from you guys. That is fantastic to hear. And I know, David, uh, that you're very well connected with a lot of companies through that process of introducing a lot of students and grads to HR departments saying, hey, look at this amazing person, you need to hire them. So I, I, I'm hoping you'll bring a bit of that, that into our discussion today around what you've learned about some of these larger companies and how they recruit. So thanks mm -hmm. so much. Absolutely. Matt, how about you? Tell us your career journey. Um, yeah, so I mean, as you mentioned earlier, you know, I'm a, somewhat of a recent grad. Uh, I graduated back in 2021, so just uh, approaching two years now. Yeah. Um, and then as part of my program, um, I had to complete two separate uh, four month long co op terms. So, eight months altogether, I was an intern. Um, and at the time, you know, I was really looking for just anything related to human resources. Um, but I found that opportunity at SickKids uh, in their talent acquisition department. And um, at the time, I only really knew about the principles of talent acquisition uh, just from my recruitment and selection course and, and some of the, the learnings I took from, from my courses at George Brown. Um, but once I started my internship, I, uh, I really found myself enjoying the work uh, involved and really learning a lot. Um, I ended up completing both terms at uh, SickKids. And I would say that was probably the most pivotal thing for me in choosing kind of how I wanted my career to develop and evolve and kind of how it's gone so far, um, because it really helped me to, to kind of develop that love for recruitment, um, which I later used in the hospital's volunteer resources department to support volunteer recruitment there, um, which I'm now using all the way up to my time here at Canadian Blood Services. And I feel like George Brown really contributed heavily to to where I am now because, um, you know, George Brown was the one who, you know, they had the opportunity for this co-op. Um, and I was able to take that academic knowledge that I had kind of learned up until that point and really put it into practice uh, in a real organization. And I don't think I would have had this opportunity uh, to be where I am now if it wasn't for the, the co-op program that George Brown was really running. Um, and it's an amazing co-op program, which I recommend to, to anyone interested, if anyone's watching this, uh, and if anyone's <laughs> interested in a co-op program at George Brown, I highly recommend it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I definitely um, I definitely say George Brown really contributed to kind of where I am now um, because they partner with some really great organizations for their co-op program. And for me, that was really key to kind of breaking into uh, the field and getting me to where I am now. Well, you bring up that's that's great. I'm, I'm so happy that George Brown College was able to to really get you on your path. And I think Matt, when you mentioned about you know you get into a place because you, sometimes you're not sure, right? You're just learning. You're, yeah. It's it's a lot of book learning, right? And then you get into uh, organization and you kind of try on a few different roles till you feel it out and see what really fits well with you. And I'm really glad to, that you found recruitment is the place to be. And it's such an exciting time for recruitment right now. And we'll, we'll be getting into that a little later, for sure. Um, Aisha, how about you? Tell us a little yeah. bit about your career path and Absolutely. whether George Brown College helped you out a bit. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, uh, just uh, echoing uh, Matthew's, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, on uh, the co-op program. So uh, I can start with where I started uh, in my HR career or my education in back in India. Uh, with a master's in HR and, uh, you know, I had two years experience and then I immigrated to Canada and that's uh, when I started looking for jobs and uh, I think I tried over a year uh, just with my experience. I tried to look for a job and uh, I didn't get anywhere. I was just like applying and not getting much uh, back from the employer. So that's when I came across this program um, at uh, George Brown College, the postgrad HR certification program and with the co-op uh, component. And that's, uh, you know, I, I thought it's the best thing to do for me right now to just go back and, you know, uh, learn or, or just refresh my memory on HR plus, you know, uh, how, uh, you know, best way to get into the Canadian workforce would be to, uh, you know, uh, get familiarized with all the, you know, uh, workforce or like with co-op that will be helpful mm -hmm. too, right? So took that and def that definitely uh, helped me. And I think that's that's the starting point of where my uh, Canadian career took off. So did a co-op, uh, completed the program. Program was excellent with 
you know, uh, amazing professors guiding through us. And I was very nervous when it came to uh, presentation or public speaking, uh, but the program had a lot of assignments where I had to go stand in front of the class and, you know, present uh, uh, some case study and that definitely improved or like built my confidence level, I, I would say. And uh, with the co-op opportunity, I think that definitely opens the doors and uh, gives the gives the students uh, and it just definitely gave me an uh, opportunity to network and connect with uh, you know other employers and uh, I did my co-op at Hilton um, uh, but then um, I uh, also had a friend uh, Ala uh, a classmate then a very good friend now uh, she did her uh, co-op at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital and uh, after I finished my co-op I had a I was just again looking for a job and that's when she in, she told me there's a opportunity at Mount Sinai Hospital to, you know, in their HR department and just to start off as a volunteer. And, uh, you know, I, I said, why not? You know, I, I I did that for at least like three days a week to begin with, maybe for a month. And then uh, into that uh, one month contract, they hired me as a full time. And this is history. That's that that was my first HR uh, job. Uh, at, uh, at a Canadian, uh, you know, organization, and uh, that's where I I met my boss uh, at Mondelez. Uh, she was my uh, supervisor at Mount Sinai Hospital, um, and you know she, uh, you know, she uh, called me over when she had an opportunity at Mondelez, and uh, I worked at Mondelez for three years. Um, took up different, uh, you know, uh, you know, different uh, functions or like just uh, tried out uh, employer branding, which I'm really passionate about. Became a team lead. Um, I also uh, tried uh, some uh, HR generalist. Uh, I took a project in one of our plants and uh, uh, tried that uh, because I was in recruitment. I just wanted to uh, expand and you know expand my uh, uh, experience in other HR functions. So that really gave me the opportunity. And then finally, now uh, you know I'm with uh, Kenview um, doing. Uh, what I love again, I'm a senior talent acquisition specialist and I love recruitment. And I think uh, where I am now definitely uh, is because of that starting point at Josh Brown College. And I feel like that shaped my career so far. And, you know, just having that connections and uh, meeting people through the program, through, uh, you know, your workplace, having that uh, networking is key to where, you know, you can go. Oh, yeah. And, you know, just listening to the three stories, hmm. a career is a journey. It's a journey. You know, you, 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 you navigate through the different streams and during that time you are, you are testing out what skills you like to use. You're meeting people and it is a journey. And so I think just listening to that just quickly, I think it's really important that, that someone who's watching this realizes that sometimes when you first graduate, it takes a little bit of time hmm. to feel it out and get into the right place. So, um, you have time on your hands too. So great. All right. Well, okay. To say the least, we have come through a rocky few years of disruption and the impact on talent acquisition has been absolutely enormous. Uh, new terms have crept into our vocabulary, like quiet quitting, rage applying, the great resignation period. Currently, our unemployment rate is an all-time low at 5% and labor shortages are being felt across sectors. It's an exciting time in many respects for job seekers and for talent acquisition. David, how does the future look for job seekers going forward? Okay, so I love this question, especially if the audience here is uh, grads, right? I think upskilling is going to play a massive part in the career progression and in, in increasing your chances to get hired, right? You cannot rely just on the content that you received at school. You have to have conversations with people in your industry of interest and find out what are the really sought after skills that the industry requires. And then you have to upskill. If you brush off on what you acquired at school and if you don't have that, you need to find a way to gather or you know strengthen those skills. So that you can be more competitive. Why do I say this? Because times have changed drastically. It's very different to find a job right now to what it was when I came here in 2007, in 2006. In 17 years, is it's a completely different market, right? And you and your resume is not enough anymore. So upskilling is very important. Also, from the perspective of the candidate, I feel that these rocky times, as you describe them, 
has created more awareness on what's important to people in the work that they do, right? So I feel this is great because people will feel more empowered and people will be more selective as well on the opportunities that they decide to pursue. There's a lot of noise still around. There's still COVID. I, today I was re reading some news that there's like another wave of COVID in India that is, sorry, in China that is going to impact 6 million people and all that stuff. There's war, there's this, there's that. So it's so much noise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you need to be very selective with the jobs that you want to apply for because you want a job that where you get up in the morning and you feel at peace of mind and you don't feel that you're adding extra noise to everything that is happening around mm -hmm. us right now. So I feel that's important as well. I feel candidates will ask more and better questions to their employers. So I feel that the role of the interviews are going to be equalized to some extent. It's now not only about interviews, Interview interviewers asking questions to the candidates, but candidates will be interviewing companies as well to mm -hmm. find out if that is the right space for them or not. Of course, every candidate will have to be aware of their current reality, right? Mm -hmm. For example, someone someone who is born and raised here, maybe it's they have more uh, free will in the choices that they want to make compared to an international student that maybe has only a window of a year with their postgraduate work permit or three years, in those cases, maybe that student will have to compromise a little bit to get their phone in the door, get their documents going, get their PR, and then start the, their process, right? But I feel people will pay more attention to, to how they conduct their job search and they will find uh, places that are more aligned with what's important to them and how they want to experience growth and the vision that is aligned with their goals and values, et cetera. Oh, these are really good points, David. I think, um, you know, I think from the HR perspective, there's a there's a evolution going on that is massive around, you know, not only it's it's about accessing top talent, but it, it's now a focus on internal. I think a lot around how do you present a company that is going to be appealing and is going to support employees as they come in. Absolutely. I, Ashwari, do you want to add to that? Absolutely. Yeah, I was just going to, uh, you know, David made a great point on, um, you know, it's not just the employers looking uh, you know, uh, or asking questions to the candidates. Uh, candidates are really interested in knowing what uh, the future employers are, you know, uh, presenting. Like, what what, uh, what are the you know perks or what's what's out there? And and you know, I I feel like definitely it's a it's a good future. Definitely is looking bright for job seekers because uh, I think there's a lot of jobs out there now. Uh, from like three years before, I know COVID. Uh, disrupted a lot of things and uh, supply chain uh, was a huge uh, issue and I work in supply chain and uh, uh, I work on uh, research and development uh, roles uh, for my current company and I'm definitely seeing a rise uh, in uh, you know these roles and uh, you know it's it and we are you know ma manufacturing uh, company as well so we are you know it's definitely looking good in the manufacturing side of business and you know we also uh, not just the you know the on-site roles but there's also the hybrid uh, working situation now which is uh, something which was not very common or not something which was talked about before before mm -hmm. covid and that's something you know employers are realizing now and they are also being very you know flexible and understanding seeing what we went through during the pandemic and uh, work life balance is something uh, which you know the potential candidates are also looking at so that's these are some things uh, you know um, which which you can expect from the employer as well as you know the the market is uh, picking up so i feel like you know what david said uh, choose what you know uh, which company you want to go um, and uh, ask questions and this this also uh, promotes that conversation and the company and employers will also be uh, interested in seeing how you know how involved you are at, or you did your homework or it's not something just what we want it's also what you want right so um, I think that's uh, that's important these days yeah absolutely and uh, Matt are you seeing a big upswing in in hiring from your through your lens uh, whether that's through the organization you work for or um, you know, connections with other HR around what, what you're seeing out there? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been that way for for as long as I've really been working in talent for, for the small amount of time compared to everyone else here. Um, but yeah, I think uh, David and Ashwari both made great points. Um, I think it really, I think an organization that is able to kind of 
market their postings and kind of really sell what they offer to the candidates will mm-hmm. really be the ones who are leading the pack in terms of getting this top talent in this really competitive, um, you know, atmosphere that we live in uh, currently. Um, so I think a lot of organizations really should be taking the time to kind of look at themselves, say, here, what do we offer? Like, what are we offering these candidates right now? What what will attract candidates to us? And I think you know, organizations that really kind of lean into that and really spend the time to kind of analyze what's going on in the job market right now and really kind of looking at how they market their jobs to candidates, I feel like those organizations um, will really find themselves um, succeeding where others may not if they are kind of just, you know, keeping on as they have been. I think you really need to be adaptable from a recruitment uh, perspective to kind of what's going on uh, in the external job market. Mm. And it makes me think, and I I just want to ask this, I'm going to throw this question in too. Um, You know, you're right, Matt, when you talk about how you present the company, where you post those opportunities. And I wanted to ask, uh all of you who are experienced in hr and recruitment you know do you find companies um are 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 tending to post more exclusively on their own career sites so they're spending the time on improving the look of that um with content that's attractive to potential candidates or are they still focused on the job search sites like indeed or workopolis what what is your feeling or sense of that um, I I would definitely say website plays a big role, um, and uh, we uh, you know we make sure the posting everything needed is there as well as the content on who we are, what are we doing, what are our values, uh, you know what is our vision, um, and uh, where are we you know where are we looking to go and all those things. So that's something uh, you know a website can give, and I think it's very important to have a a good website with the content and you know uh putting your job posting there is uh is key um and i i i see i feel like the trend now is yeah like i think linkedin is picking up a lot more than the other mm-hmm. uh, you know sites like indeed or workopolis a mm-hmm. uh, lot of people are on indeed i mean sorry on linkedin and uh, i think a uh, lot of companies either post it directly or the jobs get pulled uh, through LinkedIn and uh, our, you know, jobs are advertised on LinkedIn as well. So uh, we post, you know, uh, if you have a profile, like as a recruiter, uh, I do, and then I advertise my jobs uh, on LinkedIn and, you know, add the link to these uh, job postings. So when you click the link, it takes you to the website. And this way, it, all the applications are collected in our applicant tracking system, but then we can, you know, advertise them in our, not just in our website, but in LinkedIn as well. So interesting. Um, okay, so um, that's interesting because I'm always fascinated about like w- when's it going to happen? I mean, I always feel like when's it going to happen when HR says, don't send us resumes, just send us your link to LinkedIn. We don't need all that, all that. And I wonder when that will happen. I, I think one day it's got to happen. It's, <laughs> but I keep waiting. <laughs> anyway, regardless though, right? Of, of, you know, there's, there's, uh, candidates out there looking for work and they have to bring skills to the table and regardless of the job employees need both hard and soft skills to succeed in today's workplace an employee can have highly tuned technical skills but not necessarily be successful in a job unless they have also they also possess people skills right so um, I should I wanted to ask you what are some of the broad soft hard and hard skills employers are looking for um, and what really differentiates a candidate from an, uh, another around that? And that's and the two part question. And how does a graduate make sure they're expressing those skills on a resume and in an interview? Absolutely. Um, this, you know, uh, this skill set cannot get old. Communication is definitely, you know, uh, it can sound very simple, you know, but it's it's something which is uh, which is uh, which needs to be embedded in your uh you know uh in yourself to be successful in this so communication skills is definitely the most important soft skill i will feel uh either be oral written presentation skills or talking to uh, you know your colleagues or leaders um it it starts with 
communicating. You're basically communicating uh, through your resume, your writing, uh, you know, uh, your skills on, you know, how you put your resume together. Uh, it's that's a way of communicating your cover letter and in interview uh, that, you know, the oral communication skills comes through those, uh, you know, uh, oral interviews or like the video uh, interviews. Right? So that's definitely uh, something. Uh, which is very important um, and, you know, in this fast paced environment, I feel like managing your priorities well, being organized is something. Uh, uh, I think that's that's also one of the top uh, other soft skills and. You know, just some technical skills like MS office, you know, word Excel definitely, uh, you know, uh, it's good to have uh, and uh, even if it's not like, you know, advanced, uh, I think just that basic. Uh, skill set on and familiarity with those softwares helps with you know just reporting or anything which and that those are very common in any jobs uh, right now just to uh, put an excel together just presenting something um and uh, you know just be eager to learn and you know that show that leadership skills uh, employers are always looking for that uh, leader uh, mm -hmm. to hire in a very very early stage so just show that you're eager to learn take initiative like and these things you can show in your resume by highlighting some of your key skills which you have and maybe uh, just put it on the top of you know like some bullet points just so that you know that's something which strikes the recruiter first when they uh, you know review your resume you know it's always good to have it you know short but you know having those highlighted skill sets in the top uh, helps and uh, also come prepared uh, with some examples uh, mm -hmm. for your interview. Uh, just showcasing these skills because it's it's uh, easy to say I'm you know great uh, at communication. I have great interpersonal skills, but how do, how do how do you put that? Uh, how does the employer know that you have to maybe give some examples? So come prepared with some examples. Uh, you know, uh, to your interview, and if you can highlight some kind of achievements in your uh, resume that that uh, showcases uh, those skill sets, that would be great too. Can I, David, I to that? yeah, yeah, I think you're vigorously nodding, and I just yes. can't wait to hear what you've got to add. Because I really, I really love the point that you that you uh, that you just uh, brought to the table. Like, so we mentioned that you know you can. It's easy to write on your resume that you have great communication skills and. Uh, outstanding problem solving abilities, right? So for me, it's, it's, it's a huge turn off when I see a resume and it says proven track record, demonstrated ability. How do you prove that claim? If I'm talking to you right now, face to face or through a video, I say, okay, so you wrote here that you have a proven track record. Tell me more. And then you can advocate for yourself, but the paper doesn't talk, right? So as part of communication in writing in a resume specifically, you have to be extra concise. And you cannot leave loose points and leave things for the imagination of the recruiter because the recruiter doesn't have time to, to try to figure out how did you have that proven track record. So you always have to think when I when I write this right when, when I'm writing my resume, how do I actually prove this claim? So you have to be a little bit more concise, right? So that's when when the accomplishment statements come to the table. And I also love what you mentioned about having examples to back up your claims as well. Right, because I think it's very important. So, in on top of the the or in addition to the skills that you that you mentioned, I also feel communication to me is also the most important one, because you can be the most technical person and you can be a Bill Gates in technology, but if you don't know how to explain this new software to a non-technical audience, you're fried. Yes, so communication is very important, but also problem solving, and adaptability. Right, so it's how you build your stories around around all those skills. So if they ask you about a time when you solved a problem, then you need to have a story that can support that and that has a positive outcome. And interestingly enough, that story that you use for problem solving can also serve to ask to answer a question about leadership, because one story incorporates different skills. It's not that when you do one thing at work, it's like okay, with I complete this task. By only doing leadership, no, like you have to do leadership, problem solving, ideation, communication, right? So my recommendation is, right, because people struggle a lot. Oh my God, okay, stories, stories, stories. Okay, build an arsenal of five to 10 stories that you're very comfortable with that definitely showcase your, your expertise or the contribution that you have made that you can use interchangeably throughout the conversation that you're gonna have with that recruiter or that hiring manager. 
Oh, that is such good advice. And mm -hmm. here's an added piece of advice. I find because we're talking about communication on your phone. Everybody has a mic. They can they can record. And yeah. I I think that it's really important for you to hear how you sound when you answer questions, so that you can see. Well, where am I hesitating? Where am I stumbling mm -hmm. over a word? Because you know, I, I know a lot of people when they hear communication is the top skill, can be a little nervous if English is not their first language, and they know they're going to be interviewing in English. Mm -hmm. And I want to appease that a little bit around. First of all, you're probably better than you think, you know, yep. don't, you can't, you, you don't have to go in there being perfect. But if you do practice a little bit and record it, hear yourself speak, you will know where you stumble and therefore you can focus on that and maybe get a little bit better around it. Mm -hmm. So really, really <laughs> good points. Okay, I think LinkedIn was mentioned and we can't go without talking a little bit more about <laughs> LinkedIn. So here's this. So LinkedIn is a popular platform for people from across all industries. We know that. Here's something that's going to floor you. According to the research company Statista, mm -hmm. there are, as of April of this year, 21.9 million LinkedIn users in Canada. Now mm -hmm. that's pretty oh. crazy considering our entire population is 38 <laughs> million. That's insane. <sighs> so, wow. so I'm going to start with Matt. What's all the fuss about, Matt? Uh, what's going on with with LinkedIn? Oh. Yeah, you know, LinkedIn is is an amazing uh, tool uh, for for anyone who's interested in you know develop, developing themselves through their career, um, you know, meeting new connections, networking, that kind of thing. It, it's extremely uh, important. I definitely recommend everyone has a LinkedIn if if you are interested in you know developing your career and, and moving to new places. Um, and, you know, I think if you have a complete and informative LinkedIn profile that has all of your information, has a really good summary of yourself, I think, you know, you're more likely to have a recruiter maybe reach out to you or you're yeah. more likely to get a response to your to any like outbound uh, communications you may be doing. If you have a LinkedIn page that someone can refer to uh, where they can see at a glance, here is my story um, up until this point. Um, you know, I think it's it's definitely a great supplement uh, to have in addition to like, you know, the traditional submitting a resume and a cover letter. Um, I think it is definitely useful if you're interested in a career in a field where maybe, you know, your role is going to be more technical, maybe hard to, um, you know, hire in, um, if maybe there's not a lot of people in the industry that you're in, um, I feel like your LinkedIn profile can really, um, provide a good resource for recruiters who are maybe trying to recruit, um, in an industry that maybe is hard to recruit for. Um, because there's lots of ways that they can locate you as long as you're, um, you know, adding that information to your LinkedIn profile, which is why it's so important to make sure that you are keeping it uh, updated uh, accordingly. Um, and I would say, you know, if there are um, really important sections that you should really focus on, definitely your summary um, is, is the main one. It's usually the first thing people will see when they look at your LinkedIn profile is your summary. It's a nice kind of high level snapshot of who you are as a professional. It's probably gonna be the first thing someone reads. So please make sure if you are, you know, having a LinkedIn profile, you do have a really nice summary that kind of summarizes who you are. Um, and then also just making sure your experience is all updated as well. Um, you know, and make sure making sure it matches what's in your resume. Um, I feel like are both very important uh, points as well. For sure, those those are great points to make. How important it is and how. You know that summary you're right it's the introduction and when you go on to a linkedin it doesn't you don't go down too far with your eyes sight um before you hit the summary now yeah. here's something and i wanted everyone to weigh in on on linkedin um but i i'm i'm curious because i heard some one of the latest things not so late but maybe in the last little while uh that do you know make it a story i mean storytelling is a huge part i think yeah. david mentioned the interview is really about storytelling the resume to a certain extent in a limited format, but the LinkedIn allows for that extension, Matt, you're right. It's like an extension on your resume. You can give it a more 3D feel by mm -hmm. really talking about who you are. How do you, what do you think about that, David? Do you agree that you can really use LinkedIn to, to wow a recruiter? 100%. So, so uh, for, for the grass who are, who are looking at this uh, or watching this uh, conversation, LinkedIn is not your resume online. LinkedIn is a landing page. So you need to see your profile as a landing page. You need to see your profile as, a, as your personal website. So you have to be very critical. And again, that's why you have to have really honest and deep conversations with yourself. And then ask yourself, okay, so if, if I wanna go work for Tesla, Microsoft, TD, Scotiabank, and a hiring manager from those companies, they land on my LinkedIn profile, what do I want to be known for? 
what will attract them to right, click on the see more thing on your about section, right? So it's a landing page. So with their banner picture. So immediately you need to capture people's attention, right? Again, times are evolving. And what we don't have in this society is time. So people will give you just seconds and decide, okay, maybe I'll go to another profile, right? So you need to captivate them from the or intrigue them from the very get go. Let me tell you a story about the power of this platform, mm. right? I have a client of mine who is actually a, a George Brown uh, alumni who is who found a job in the pandemic as a manager at Scotia Bank, right? She recently got promoted at Scotia Bank at a much senior level, right? And then she called me, David, oh my God, David, I just got promoted. I start next week, but another major financial institution called me for another opportunity and it looks amazing. I don't know what to do. I just said, I'm like, what do you mean you know how you don't know how to do what to do? Go to the interview. But what do I'm like, I understand, right? And then this is this is the loyalty of the candidate, right? I just I've been here for two years. I like my job. It's crazy busy. I just got the promotion and I feel guilty because someone is reaching out to me to look to show me another opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. So they reach out to her because they saw on her LinkedIn, right, how skilled she is and the value that she can potentially add to the organization. Right. So what what the beauty about LinkedIn is that when you apply to a job, and for example, you ask where you, you call them, right? You are mm -hmm. in control mm -hmm. because you're asking the questions and you're looking for the person. But when, for example, in, the, in this person's case, this person is employed, she's happy with her job and she get connected by someone and tell them, hey, there's an opportunity, do you wanna chat about it? Mm -hmm. The candidate is in control because the candidate can negotiate, can make demands on in the kindest manner possible, of course, but, but, the, but the, 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 the way shifts a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Long story short, this person going, went through the, through, through the entire process, right? She came up with a solution after the first, first interview. She wowed the, all the VPs that she talked to about, and she got a role that is paying her $30,000 more than what she's making. That's wow. what she's making in her last promotion at this financial institution. So, but still is the, mm -hmm. oh my God, how do I tell them? And so then the conversation with us was like this, right? In the world of work, there's no one who is indispensable. If they need to get rid of you or lay you off, they will. Mm -hmm. There's no second thought. So why wouldn't, again, without burning bridges and stuff, mm -hmm. and people would need to understand, okay, they're paying me $30,000 more than you guys are, right? Mm -hmm. And it's an opportunity for progression for this to do all this they need to understand first that your profile is in high demand and mm -hmm. that you will get invitations from other people and that and you can achieve that if your linkedin profile is a true representation of you and your personal brand so it's so true yeah magical thing it's a magical platform to be honest well especially in this competitive atmosphere out there you yes. want to really be someone who who stands out and ashwara can i ask you as a recruiter when you are viewing that profile where do your where do your eyes rest? What are some additional things you're looking for too? Yeah, um, you know, uh, first of all, love LinkedIn. It's the best thing which can happen uh, to a to a recruiter. Um, and uh, for me, I feel like you know um, when I look into a profile and. And when I am looking, it's not like, you know, just active recruitment. It's also passive, right? So you, you're building a pipeline. You want to, you know, uh, you want to prepare for what's coming down, uh, you know, uh, a high demand, high demanding job or wet job, this, which has a lot of uh, attrition. So um, I would definitely use the filters in, uh, you know, uh, LinkedIn search or we have a LinkedIn recruiter. So um, if you're looking for a job, uh, Put, a, put that uh, cool feature of open to work or, you know, just having your uh, profile highlighted to say, I'm, I'm looking and this can be either actively looking someone's, you know, uh, they, they're, you know, in between jobs or actively looking or some people, they might just uh, like, you know, what David said, like, they might not actually be looking, but mm -hmm. they will put that feature in saying, you know, I, I'm interested in hearing if there's any opportunity out there. And that's, uh, you know, uh, and I've 
head hunting is huge and uh, you know it's also great to hear from a recruiter it boosts confidence uh, for candidates right like okay so i you know um, i am uh, recognized by other like other uh, employers and recruiters so um, having that feature you know turned on either having that badge if you're actively looking open to work or uh, you know uh, having those uh, features turned on in your profile is I feel uh, key so I look for that so when I look for candidates I think I go for the ones who are now actively looking uh, if I want to uh, you know hire someone immediately or looking to fill a role uh, immediately other things is a uh, skill set so um, you have to uh, update so you're David said your and uh, you know what Matthew said like you have to uh, you know update your profile and uh, that's your website it is it is uh, you know you, you can't uh, put everything in your resume and LinkedIn is where you can tell your story and uh, be creative right so that's uh, something if you have a skill set a job seeker or job uh, an employer is looking for add those skill set in your general profile in a summary or, or just highlight them so uh, you know uh, it's easier to get matched uh, for a job right. uh, you can also get recommended matches when you have those skill set uh, mentioned in your profile um, and just you know uh, when it comes to uh, other concepts like you know just the head headline just having it mm -hmm. uh, clear having a clear and simple headline uh, avoid uh, keeping abbreviations uh, not every uh, organization would have the same title right so just having that clear function uh, listed or just uh, something uh, what you're looking to get or what you what jobs are you looking to uh, attract uh, that's that plays a key role i feel um and uh, just again uh, you know uh, that's another thing which i always look at and like you mentioned in my intro i am a huge diversity and inclusion advocate and uh, that's something uh, which uh, you know as a employer it's embedded in our recruitment process and that's something which i you know actively look for in uh, in our uh, candidates profile so if you're part of a diversity group or you know uh, any uh, you know uh, if you've mm -hmm. gone through some workshops highlighting those uh, can be uh, you know uh, beneficial as well again for yourself as well as the employer uh, looking uh, to present that uh, you know diverse candidate and diverse lead. Well, you know, and, and you just at the end, of, you're touching on something that I think is really important to touch on, which is, you know, LinkedIn makes it kind of easy for you. You can get LinkedIn badges. If you access to LinkedIn Learning and graduates have access for one year after they oh, complete. Oh, nice. And Anything. it's free for students and, and actually right. staff while we're here. And it, and so use it. It's it's an amazing thing to have. Um, we are actually, alumni is launching a master class for LinkedIn to teach nice. uh, grads how to use it. But if you... If you can't wait, I've also done a video, so you can go on to my webinar site on on the alumni web pages, and I've nice. I've done that. You can also join mine, like just link with me, um, because I think what's really important is to have that show that lifelong learning, but yeah. also the featured section so underused. Yes. Featured, like if you've done something you're really proud of, you've got a report. Take a take something of a piece of the report and upload it onto your featured site. Um, there's so many things you can do with featured and it's, I think, I think it was Matt that said it really stands in as a kind of portfolio or that mm -hmm. additional place where you can really uh, like a web page. Right? And so I think it's, it needs to be utilized well. Okay. I, okay. So the next thing I wanted to ask about, and this is actually to Matt because one of the things I get a lot of questions around grads are like, what's an, what's an applicant tracking system? What does that mean? And how do I ensure that my resume gets through the ATTS? So Matt, can you enlighten us as to what it is, first of all, and how, what are grads need to be aware of when they are navigating an ATS system? Yeah, so, uh, you know, an, an applicant tracking system is essentially uh, the system that the recruiters will use to track <laughs> the candidates throughout uh, the entire recruitment process for a specific uh, position that's being recruited for from essentially beginning um, from application all the way through to interviews all the way to uh, an offer. Um, and there are a lot of applicant tracking systems out there uh, and a lot of them do things differently. Every organization will, will probably have, you know, different ones, um, depending on what they, what their needs are. Um, but most of them tend to share kind of the same fun uh, basic functionalities. Um, they tend to contain, you know, different like buckets or folders that can candidates are kind of sorted into, um, by the recruiters. 
Um, and then as they move through the recruitment process on to interviews and so on, uh, the candidates kind of flow through the system. Um, and a common feature, um, I'm sure a lot of uh, grads have heard about this, is like um, that a lot of recruiters are looking for specific keywords um, yeah. when applicants are applying. Um, a lot of that goes through the ATS. So um, if a recruiter has a really high volume of applicants for a specific position, um, they can kind of narrow that down quickly uh, by doing a specific keyword search. And what that does is it basically looks at all the applicants, looks at all of their resumes that they've uploaded, and kind of narrows down um, the candidates um, so the recruiter can see, okay, so who's mentioned um, what I'm looking for in their resumes? Um, and that's why it's so important uh, to ensure that you know your resume and your cover letters um, are being tailored to the position that you're applying for. It's so important. Um, for example, you know, if a, if a role is really emphasizing that you need to use Power BI, for example, uh, for a specific position and you know you've used it, make sure you're putting that in your resume and don't just mention that you're, you know, in like in your skills section, don't just put Power BI. You want to say, I use Power BI um, and give an example, kind of like David was mentioning earlier. Um, you want to kind of elaborate, especially if the job is kind of really emphasizing that. Mm -hmm. um, so don't miss those important points. Make sure you are kind of customizing your, your resume to the position because a lot of recruiters um, who are dealing with high volumes will be using their ATS systems to, to look for those specific keywords. And you might have the experience for this job. You might have the technical skills, but if you're not putting it in your resume, the recruiter might miss that. Um, okay. Um, is there anything that a grad should not uh, have on their resume that will exclude them through the ATS system or process? Um, I would say it's kind of subjective. It's hard to say. Um, I don't know if David or Ashwarya can, can comment on that a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I would say as long as you're kind of giving that accurate kind of, um, you know, accurate examples of what you've done, you're, you're providing that information clearly and, and written clearly in a way that, that can be kind of read through quickly because, again, recruiters deal with high volumes. They might just skim through your resume. You need to make sure it's written in a way that's clear and easy to understand. Um, so just kind of, you know, avoiding really long, you know, bullet points that are right. kind of like really long and hard okay, to read yeah. through. Mm. But um, I don't know if David or Ashwari want to. Yeah, <laughs> I would say ahead. just keep it short, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Don't have three, four pages of resume. Mm -hmm. um, try to be very uh you know uh, precise on like what you want to uh, like maybe like a couple of bullet points under uh, each job um and just again like what uh, you know uh, Matthew was saying in terms of uh, you know what the job seek or like the employer is looking for put that skill in and just just uh you know uh, write a line about it and keep it at that don't uh, have too many paragraphs or you know uh too many uh words and keep it clean. I would say just, you know, if it's so uh, wordy and, uh, you know, you can't really read it, it's it's definitely something, uh, you know, uh, which would be not paid too much. Like, it's just, it, it takes so long. And when it when it's easy on your eye, it's easier to see all those keywords. Uh, but when it's okay. too wordy, it's, it's hard to, like, you know, read everything. And then just, you might just get you know, you might miss on those uh, key things which you want to convey. So, good points, all good points. Okay, I'm just keeping my eye on the time, and I really, really want to get to this topic because I think it's very, very important. So, there is a number that's thrown out around there, and it is that 85% of jobs are found through networking. It's a pretty high number. Um, we know how important networking is to the overall job search process. David, what's your suggestion to grads on ways to continue that engagement when so many are working from home nowadays? Um, and that's, I have another two part question. Yeah. If networking played a role in your career development, share that with us. And I know it did. So I want to oh, hear. <laughs> so I'm going to start with that one. Okay. Because it did. So. I think that the, the statistic is there for a reason, right? And I, and I feel that the best career opportunities will always happen through a connection and a referral because you skip the line. Mm -hmm. You skip the line of the hundreds of applicants that are, that are competing with you for the same role. If someone can vouch for you and someone can forward your resume to, to Matthew or to Aishwarya, right? They just you skip the line, right? Um, so as a personal anecdote, the last time that I applied for a job was in 2009. Other than that, all my opportunities, including my teaching role at George Brown and my 
personal development stuff having all this happening through a referral or a connection and through a network, right? So I think it, 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 it plays an incredible role. One thing that you will have to know though, is that networking hardly ever pays off immediately. You have to cultivate the relationship, right? Imagine you have a plant, right? And you've planted seeds, right? The, the, the plant is not going to bloom the next day. It takes time. And I feel it's the same with relationships as well, right? So what I would recommend, for example, and then again, talking about, for example, the, the grad community at George Brown, that is a combination of local students and international students, right? Local mm -hmm. students know that, you know, we have to talk to people and you have our networks because the parents are li live here and the friends of the parents and the friends of high school and whatnot. Maybe the international candidate doesn't have the same network. So for them, it's an extra challenge. So, and it could be awkward sometimes because some cultures, they do not network, they have find that there are jobs ready for them after graduate and you cannot talk to someone who is older. Many cultural restrictions, right? Mm -hmm. So what I would do if I was in, a, in, a, in the case of the recent grads is that start connecting, first of all, with the people who are in your cluster graduating with you and see what they're up to and what kind of job they're getting and how is the process and what what mistakes they made so that you don't repeat the mistakes and also connect with people who have graduated from your program. So you, you can you can reach out to the alumni relations departments to see if you, they can expedite some of those relationships, those connections, or your program coordinator, or your faculty, etc. And then once you connect with an alumni, ask who else from your program do you think it would be worth connecting with? And that's how you start. And you get comfortable. Mm -hmm. So the next time when you have to reach out to someone that you don't know anything about, you're not going to feel as nervous. And then you're going to have more clarity on what message you can send and whatnot, right? So it's cultivating their relationship and it's making people feel that they're not just a transaction if they give you their time for an informational interview, right? Always, and this is, this is, this is something that, I, again, I, I'm, I, I talk from personal perspectives and what <laughs> has worked for me. And, and, and has worked for my clients as well. When you go to an informational interview, right? You, of course, you wanna get insights into the, the, the job, the profession, the industry and whatnot, but always take time to add one person that is related to the person, right? <laughs> what is something that you like doing outside the scope of work? And then <laughs> conversation that you make a note of that because in your next interaction with that person, you're gonna bring that up. So if the person told you that they like tennis, I don't know, and then the Roland Garros, the Roland Garros tournament is happening right now. You can send him an article of how one player beat the other one, and then you keep the conversation, and then it makes the person on the other end feel special. That okay, this person is paying attention to me, to not only the advice that I'm giving them professionally, but also me as a person, because I am more than my job title, and I am more than mm -hmm. my job and my my profession and my company, right? So I think it's a good way to connect and 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 and. and and kind of water those relationships that can pay off down the road with a referral sure. or something, yeah? Building those relationships are essential. Matt, how about you? How do you feel about networking as an essential piece of job search? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's 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 really, really important that once you're kind of out into the field that you never really, like once you graduate, you don't really stop, you know, making connections, whether it's, you know, through LinkedIn and all of the, the amazing tools available there. Um, and even George Brown, um, kind of echoing what David said, George Brown has a lot of resources um, for grads and alumni to kind of stay connect connect uh, connected to other grads and also to build new connections. You know, there's volunteering opportunities, different events, there's mentoring programs that can help you, uh, you know, connect and network to, to other George Brown grads. Um, you know, I'm someone who's currently participating in the mentorship programs, and I feel like it's really helped, you know, me, um, you know, meet new people. You know, I'm here today meeting everyone here. That's that's a connection built there. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And I feel like utilizing the resources that George Brown offers really will help you in building network uh, networks and also to stay in touch with other uh, people that you have something in common with uh, in terms of both being George Brown uh, students. Um, so definitely kind of once you graduate, um, I would definitely recommend stay connected to, to what's going on with, with, with George Brown and kind of what they're doing for alumni because it'll really kind of help you um, kind of meet new people and and who knows what'll happen. It could open a new door for you um, to a new opportunity if you're if absolutely. You're that's great. You know, you're, you're right, Matt. And please, anyone who is watching this, feel free to reach out alumni at georgebrown.ca. Um, and we will, and let us know if you're looking to connect with a past grad, you need to do an informational meeting just to find out about someone who's in a role that you're interested in or working for an organization that you're interested in, please reach out.
Um, Aisha, well, how about you? What, what has networking played a big part in your uh, career journey? And also, how do you look at that from the perspective of HR as well? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, networking and, uh, and uh, referrals are like huge. And I think most of, uh, you know, my, uh, my jobs, uh, except for the last one uh, has been through referral. My first job was through, a uh, a uh, classmate then uh, and a good friend now uh and that's how i you know started and and like what uh, david and matthew said it's it's uh, nurturing those relationship and uh, you know making it can be your classmate or your professor or when you're volunteering you know uh, other uh, other students or you know faculty just have that having that uh, genuine connection and relationship uh, and uh, it's not something you can you know uh, like what uh, david said it's not something you can expect tomorrow but it, mm. when you have that connection when you make it personal people will remember you and uh, you know um, that's when you get you know called and say hey uh, there is an opportunity i thought of you uh, you know are you interested so um, having that connection is is definitely uh, you know uh, helpful and uh, it definitely played a major role in my 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 career so um, maybe a colleague or a, a supervisor or a manager you know having that uh, building that relationship uh, takes you a long way nice i know networking is just such an important piece and you you learn from it you build your you, you really grow from from reaching out and, and getting to know other people doing different things now we are at 301 Oh my gosh. So I want, I'm just going to ask you one thing and then. Okay. So, um, one piece of advice that you have, uh, for graduates in 10 words or less. And I'm going to go, I know, sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to start with David. David thinks fast on his feet. What do you think? I'm going to go with conciseness is king. Okay, concise is on the resume. Your communication, okay. written and verbal communication. Yes. Okay, beautiful. Matt, how about you? I would say, um, don't be afraid to be uncomfortable and put yourself into into like a, a situation that you might not be super comfortable with in terms of your career, because um, you never know where that'll get you. And sorry, that's not ten words. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, Aisha, Aisha. Um, I was gonna say, uh, you know, uh, go out of your comfort zone. You know. Um, challenge yourself. Uh, that's how you grow. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, David, Matt, Aishwara for thank joining you. us today for sharing your stories. They're very interesting to grads. Interesting to me. Your insights, career advice are incredibly valuable to graduates. So we really appreciate your time. Thank, thank you, you so for much for inviting you. us. Okay. So take care, everyone. Stay safe and good luck as you move into or forward in your career. Stay tuned for other alumni uh, events coming up. You can learn about those events through our newsletter, our website, or through our social media channels. So be sure to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. To update your contact information and to give us permission to continue to connect with you, go to alumni at georgebrown.ca. Bye for now.